These questions are designed to unfold and explain your teachings and asked in the context of the teachings of Ramana Mahashi, which reflects the ancient wisdom. There is the fundamental question, who am I? Who are you? Uh, who am I? <clears throat> but there is no other explanation that can be given except that I am the consciousness itself, just consciousness and functioning in this uh, body. This is what I would say, I am consciousness. <clears throat> Many seekers are looking for enlightenment as if it is an experience. What is enlightenment? Mm -hmm. Enlightenment is simply to know who or what oneself truly is, as apart from our conditioning, the identification with the, the body, which appears as a sort of separate self, but it is not, it's only the idea we have of ourself. So um, one can go through life, one meaning consciousness itself, identified with the body and feeling itself to be the body. It can seem enough to go through this body, bodily existence, with that feeling or that belief, I am only the body. But enlightenment really refers to that self-awareness, wherein one discovers I am not merely the body, nor the thinking, nor the conditioning, nor the apparent identity that arises as a person, but that I am that in whose presence all that appears as manifestation, as life, as time, relationship, space, all of this is perceived in me. But myself cannot be perceived directly or phenomenally because I have no form. I have no lasting form, apparent form. But the form itself is also appearing in me, that sort of intelligence, but it has itself no form. And when that understanding has really settled or happened uh, to itself, that is ordinarily referred to as awakening, liberation, enlightenment. Mm. Yes. So it's not an experience? Well, I'm very careful, you know, because sometimes we, it seems as though uh, a lot of fuss is made around words and the terminologies, when in the real understanding, all the terms can be more flexible, more lightly used. So sometimes I feel that there can be a bit of mistake in putting too much attention on the terms and it's not an experience and so on. It's not an experience in the sense that experiences ordinarily are durations in time. They come and they go. They have a beginning and an ending. Whereas what we are is before beginnings and endings. So therefore, the perception of beginnings and endings appear in it, but it itself is beginningless. And there is an intuitive knowing of this uh, beyond even conviction, actually. So, therefore, when it is said, it cannot just merely be an experience, because all experiences, they have a, a birth, they have a time when they happen, and a time when they pass. And what is cannot be said to pass. Everything else appears and passes in front of it, or within it, but it itself cannot pass, being itself infinite and constant. So, like in this um, context, one cannot say it is an experience. And sometimes <clears throat> I've heard the term beyond enlightenment. Beyond enlightenment. Could you comment about beyond enlightenment? <laughs> I don't know what the term is referring to. Mm -hmm. It may be beyond the, uh, if we use enlightenment to mean the recognition of that which has no beginning and has no end. So the recognition may happen in time and the recognition may be felt to be an experience. But what the experience is of is itself timeless. 
So when one speaks about beyond enlightenment, I don't know what they are referring to. Um, before enlightenment, during enlightenment, after enlightenment, I don't know. This is all mind stuff for me. Mm -hmm. It simply means, uh, finally, the self, previously taking itself to be in time by holding onto the body, which is time-bound, perceive itself to be also the casualty of time in its own thinking. But now coming uh, through grace, through satsang, to realize that it itself is timeless, that it is not a, a phenomenon, that it is that in whose presence the phenomenon they appear, all phenomena appear in it. But it itself cannot be directly perceived because it is beyond quality. Mm. That, that is all that needs to happen. Beyond, uh, the, it, then this is sort of like, I think, using mind. Mm -hmm. Beyond enlightenment, I don't know what is what is being referred to. Meaning, beyond the concept of non-enlightenment and enlightenment. This I can say, okay, fine. Beyond the concept of uh, ignorance and the concept of knowledge. You may say this. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing there to measure, to say beyond this. There's nothing there to compare. To compare, you have to go into the realm of mind or that uh, fluid consciousness, then you can talk about comparison. But beyond this, that which is earlier than the beingness or the feeling, I exist. There's nothing to compare. There's no time. There's no space, no you, <clears throat> no me there. And it is the most natural. It is the most natural and uh, naturally effortless and silence. All conversations end. All journeys end. They have their their sense of reality in the realm of the uh, relative, in the mind. But here, behind the moving mind, into that place of complete silence, where there's no one there to maintain or to keep silence or to do anything at all, that which is referred to as being awake to one's true nature, then beyond this, I, I think it's speculation, I don't know who speak this, mm -hmm. beyond the concept of being and non-being, you can say, it so, cannot be known in the mind like, like this. And so equally, there's not a question of levels of enlightenment. No, I don't perceive <laughs> it like this. I right. know that these are sort of uh, increasingly popular terminologies being used. Mm. Levels of enlightenment, I, am not, I cannot conceive of what it can be. If we speak about the pure, that which is pure and eternal, but it's not wearing the label eternal, it doesn't call itself anything. It's unnameable. And we are that. And the whole journey of apparently searching for truth is in order to recognize that, which is itself natural and effortless. So somehow, in, the, in its dynamic expression as the feeling of existence inside the body that we all know so well, the feeling I, I am, I call this more the active consciousness. In this space, even after the truth is recognized, there continue to be a sort of maturing somehow. It's inevitable. It continues uh, becoming more and more refined. The conscious becoming more and more refined. So there's movement there. But that movement is taking place against a background of unmoving, unchanging awareness. This is a sort of paradox, I, I, I think. So you may talk about somehow uh, levels, we can use the language of levels in, in, in the realm of what is changeful, what is in movement, like in the, the feeling of progressive being or something. But beyond this, there are no levels. There's no one there to attain even the level, in fact. Mm. Yes. Mm. Okay. Mm. Are there any qualifications for enlightenment? And is practice necessary? And if yes, what form of practice do you advise? Ah. Is there qualifications? Qualifications. The qualifications are non-personal, not the person's qualifications. I would put it very simply, we are already that. We are already this. And this has to be emphasized myself, I'm doing it, reminding over you are already that, you see. But somehow we are, seem not to be conscious of that. We are more aware of ourselves as body-mind entities and the programming and conditioning that we receive in the modification that we are personalities, we are the body and so on. So uh, it arises somehow in some beings 
an urge or something to find out, to uh, uh, stimulate it by whatever. It could be the reading of a book. On the surface, it might appear like this. Some people, they have had a little accident or the loss of a family member or something sometimes can trigger a deeper questioning may happen inside. So I don't want to create any sort of system about it because it's completely unpredictable and unexpected quite often. So there are times when people have no sense that they have any interest at all in these matters. They come into contact somehow and find that they're bursting to, to, di to dive completely into the unknown somehow. Whereas there could be others who have been seemingly steadfastly pursuing the truth and seem not to be able to go beyond a certain point. So it's like, it's almost no rules apply. I only say, if you feel some pull, then you naturally will go towards that which you are attracted to. And I like to keep it simple like this, because anything other than this, the mind uses it to sort of say, well, you know, I'm not ready, maybe not for me or something. And it's very easy to, to, to take this type of um, discouragement, because already it seems an aspect of, us, of ourself in the mind is in resistance to the direct uh, recognition of that truth inside ourselves. So I don't want to give it any food to say, oh, you have to be like this or like that. We are all that already. And in one way or another, all the beings in the world are in satsang of some form. They are on the journey of self-discovery. It may not be clear in their minds that this is what the movement is aiming at, but at some point it becomes more clear like this. Now you ask also, is there a practice? Yes, there is some practice. It's easy for some people to say, there's no practice, that is what it is, and that is true. That itself is not practicing anything. But until you know that deeply in the art, you will continue in the belief, in the experience of being a person in separation. We give it away all the time, although we may speak with our mouth and say, oh, there's nobody there, nothing exists, and so on. But our actions betray that this is not our convincing truth. Many times it is said like this, we speak very lofty words, but our body language convey, our behavior convey, that somehow we are not yet uh, stabilized in that knowledge. Because if we were, it wouldn't have this sort of ferocity. It wouldn't have the... It wouldn't carry that personal smell so directly. So, in honesty, I would say, yes, there is a sort of practice, exercise, a practice, which is to keep on mm, looking into our assumptions. Some people don't feel that when we say, I am this, I am this person, it is an assumption. They feel it is a fact. And as long as it continues to feel intimately this is a fact, it will remain unquestioned. We will not question further. But in some beings, it already is arising some suspicion about this. When one way or another it comes to us, either through a form of some reading something, seeing something, hearing something, whatever, it can just arise directly from within yourself. A question is born, like, really, who really am I? What When something says I inside this body, and since the birth of this body, it has been saying I millions and millions of times. And yet, when approached about this, well, who exactly are you that is saying I? We start to stutter and stammer about it and give sort of uh, some theory or something. We cannot speak confidently about it. So this is what really here in our conversations, this is the approach we take, to take a look at what says I here. Because really, to be honest, the feeling of I is common to all sentient beings. Just the feeling of existence. It's very common to all the beings. So much so that God, says I, but the devil says also I. And between these, it seems like a long sliding rule of I-ness is possible. So it's not like we are studying, you know, uh, an object that we can measure and say it is so many centimeters wide and so tall or so on. We are not speaking about objects. We are speaking really about a pure subjectivity. And so we cannot use the same rules that the mind use for measuring objects for measuring that which is immeasurable and formless. So we have to rely on our intuitive uh, ability, which is also there, it's also a function, uh, an ability inside us to comprehend these more subtler uh, truths. So coming back to the point about is there a practice? The practice is really to examine our usage of the term I 
because that is the most intimate word in our language. Not just a word, an intuition. It points to an intuition, a sense of being, a sense of existence. And so everything that appears in front of us seems to have behind it this assumption that I is the thinker of thought or the doer of actions. And so we begin to kind of look at that. And once the spotlight turns really to challenge and to question these common assumptions, something begins to shift, begin to break up. And not that mm, long sometimes, in a quick time, one finds that there are greater and greater depths to our sense of being, like uh, assumptions and many things we realize that we did not really know this in the heart. It was just that we assume a certain knowledge because it was uh, given to us and we absorb it like a kind of uh, osmosis or something and never really questioned. And these begin to come up in the inquiry. And so it is a, a practice uh, which one will use effectively and helpfully until one is not requiring any more to practice, until the mind is stabilized itself in the, in the understanding. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Ramana said, self-inquiry is the most direct route to realizing the self. What do you say about self-inquiry and how to conduct self-inquiry? Yeah. I'm in total agreement with Ramana's words. I use sometimes this example like it is the most unsparing tool, instrument, practice, if you may say for blowing the cover and exposing that the ego, the feeling of I, based upon the idea that I'm the body-mind, is a complete fake. I say it is as quick as looking in the mirror and seeing one's reflection. The mirror doesn't give an opinion. It doesn't tell you, please wait, I'm too busy. It's always available. And I would somehow liken the inquiry to that type of effectiveness. You see? But what happens is they take a little time to adjust because I believe even in the time of Sri Bhagwan when he was in the body, many of his devotees also did not quite appreciate the power of that question. It's evident in some of the conversations which are recorded in so many books on Ramana that uh, many of the devotees were really not appreciating the power and the potency of that question. And he was mm, approached many times to clarify wh what does it mean, who am I, should, should I say it as a sort of mantra, should I repeat it? Should I, uh, you know, it, it wasn't deeply, uh, fully comprehended, except in a few people, you see, at a time. So, um, uh, to recap, I would say that the inquiry, once understood, it is the most direct, so direct and so effective, so potent it is as a tool for revealing the self beyond speculation, that I was saying, once we are sort of following the, the line of inquiry, nothing else you need to do. You don't need to be doing bhajans at the same time or reciting a mantra or going on pilgrimage or making prayers. So complete is that uh, is its if effectiveness that nothing else is required. The inquiry itself has different um, aspects, I would say. I would like to use the, the word. It has different aspects, different moods to inquiry. Some people um, feel that it's a very rigid, uh, linear um, exercise or practice, but it has different aspects of it, and we may go a little bit into that. But before you ask me, um, the sort of uh, how do you go about the inquiry? And so, mm -hmm. the most popular, as is expressed through Bhagwan, most commonly, is to start with the feeling of I, because all the sentient beings. All human beings refer to themselves as I. We are sometimes not aware that I is a shapeshifter, actually. I would call it like this. It wears different uniforms. And according to the uniform it's wearing, it is uh, expressing itself in that modification. But the pure feeling of I, or I am, it's really non-personal. It's an impersonal, the impersonal being. And uh, it is referred to as the earliest uh, reflection of the Absolute in manifestation. The feeling I refers to consciousness. It is synonymous with the feeling of presence, of being conscious, conscious presence, you may say this, and uh, the feeling of existence, the feeling uh, I, I am. It has no other quality. 
It has no gender. It is not the body. It has no birth, has no parents, has no offspring. It is pure intuition, the pure sense of presence. But it seems as, as soon as that arises, and I have to say arises, and this is a key point to all of this, because in deep sleep it is not there. The feeling of presence is not really there. Maybe in a very, very subtle form it's there, but dualistic perception is absent. So we know that the consciousness arises in what we call the waking state. And when it arises, it uh, announces itself in the body in the feeling, I, I am. We become aware of our existence. Then other things can come in, like time or the sense of other and intention memory, intellect, all of these uh, faculties can then follow after the arising of I. So I is the most intimate. It is the earliest uh, reflection, as it said, of the Absolute mm, in uh, consciousness. But what happens is as soon as it's present, as it's available, you may say, identification with the body comes into function and it feels I am the body. And this I am the body feeling is a distortion. It is uh, a modification upon the pure feeling I am. It is this modification, the feeling I am the body, the belief I am the body, and the subsequent programming that arises upon this fundamental feeling, I am the body, I am a person. Then all the other notions can come in, and together they comprise a kind of composition which we call our identity, our personhood, or something like this, also commonly called or referred to as ego. The ego by itself is not existing independently of the consciousness. It is also consciousness, but it is consciousness in a very limiting uh, modification because it's basing its identity upon the body and because of holding on to the body, which is in time. The body has a birth, it has duration, and subsequently it will also dissolve. So it is in time. The sense I am actually being formless is also timeless, actually, in its essence, because it arises from the Absolute. But when it touches the body in belief, it comes into time experientially and believe I am going to die. The body is prone to sickness, to death. So then a trauma enters into the being that I am going to die. And that is the somehow the, the depression of humanity, somehow, because ultimately there is a subtle trauma in the psyche that uh, I can perish. So this is one of the great falls, you may say, from the state of the pure feeling of I am, which we always are, but subsequent modification of this I am, where the I am feeling joins the body and feels I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm a doctor, I am whatever it is. And it's this modification, depending upon the depth of the belief in the modification, I am the body, this is me, arises arrogance and pride and ignorance out of this. And it's that modification of consciousness which is arising in its highest aspect as a seeker after truth. Because not all the expressions of consciousness is seeking the truth directly. Indirectly, you may say, at some point it will come to that. But uh, even in the highest expressions of the seekers, mm, it is still mixed, a mixture of that beingness, the feeling I exist, and the feeling that I am the body, that cocktail of belief is producing what is where the consciousness is usually hanging out, is hanging out in the modification, I am person, you see. And that I am the person idea is really mm, causing suffering to the consciousness that arises as the feeling I am. Now, that feeling of existence really functions in all of this manifestation in its purest aspect as the perceiver of the phenomenal uh, play of the universe, including the body. It is the seer, the perceiver, the enjoyer, the taster of experiencing. It is this itself that when it is functioning in the body, it needs the body in order to have the taste of experiencing. But somehow with this uh, functioning with the body and the vital breath, the consciousness falls into a state of hypnosis and believes itself to be the body. And this is really the, the fundamental reason why consciousness comes into fragmentation, into fear, into death, all of these things come upon it. So spirituality is really the sieving out of what is untrue, what is unreal, 
so that the, the sense I am remains by itself, shining by itself, free from the identification with the body and the sense of doership and I am a person and all of this. When one reaches again, rediscovers one's original nature, the feeling I am, the unassociated consciousness, then arising out of this discovery, there is peace and space, and joy. There's a natural silence and an intuitive sense that we are eternal. It is not something that can be taught and can really penetrate into the art with conviction. It has to be experienced through real understanding, like this. And that also is revealed through inquiry. Not only inquiry, but uh, strongly through inquiry and quickly through inquiry. Yes. <clears throat> And hence, that Ramana said it's the most direct way. It is the most direct uh, way, is that it is an immediate reflection upon the seer. Because ordinarily, we are, we as the, the belief, I am the body, is posing as the seer. And it goes on question. Because, like I said, since the birth of a body, something has been announcing itself, I, 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 me, my, mine, millions of times. And that mm -hmm. assumption is often based upon the idea, I am the body. And it goes no further. Because in this world, we can transact conceptually on the basis, I am the body. It's only when we wish, for whatever reason, to go deeper than that, or sense a deeper, a deeper understanding than this, then, then you can go beyond the I am the body and discover that I am the I am itself, the godly principle inside the body, the original principle in the body that is perceiving all this manifestation in serene detachment. That is the place of the I am. Then uh, some beings, they recognize eventually that even the feeling I am, the most exquisite, the quintessential uh, experience, is itself phenomenal. And this is really the crux of uh, Ramana's pointing, that even the feeling I am itself which I sometimes call the first concept of the Supreme, the Immaculate Conception, if you like, that that itself is phenomenal. And that when you're in the position to clearly recognize that the feeling I am, the seed of existence itself, is an arising phenomenon, then you are in the unspeakable. And that, lofty as it seems, is our ordinary natural state. Somehow, this uh, intuitive recognition seems to be eclipsed by the fascination or the, con the conditioning that we are the body seems to hide this <clears throat> fundamental uh, self-awareness. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit of an aside, but it was just occurring to me. I mean, we're living here in uh, South India at the moment. Yes. And amongst us, there are many villages of very yes. simple people living oh, yes. on the land, very much in harmony with the land. Yes. And when you meet them, they are often very radiant. Yes. And there's almost the feeling that they're also living very much with what you're talking about. You know, yes. they're living very much with the self. Yes. Perhaps they're not really aware of it, yes. but there's a sense of it for somebody who can recognize it. Yes. Could you maybe say something about that? There is a light inside, which is <clears throat> really, we don't realize how much light of our natural luminosity as consciousness is hidden when we're identified merely in the selfish aspect as I am the body, I am the person. It's a kind of selfishness. And what is happening uh, many times in the people you refer to, like the ordinary uh, peasants from the countryside, they have a brightness about them, a brightness. They are not really thinking of themselves that often, actually. They are not obsessed with their, their sort of personalities. Maybe life is so demanding, it doesn't give them any time to be thinking about makeup and how they appear to be and so on. It's, there's a practicality, a pragmatism about life. And it is just, there's no time for decorative thinking. They're not uh, caught up in sophisticated thinking. The life is really functioning on a very practical level and uh, very fundamental actually. And there's a, there's a purity in this, there's a, a, a clearness, a, a, a clean feeling about it, but still, they are not free. They are not free. Some are, when we speak, uh, many of these people are highly devotional in temperament. And it has been an experience of mine recently that having met some of these people who, who really 
they have a, a relationship with a teacher, a master, where, for instance, a woman ordinarily, ordinarily doesn't, don't put questions to the teacher directly, or even indirectly, they don't write letters or anything. They function merely in the position of only listening, and then they try to imbibe what they have, to assimilate what they have heard, like this. And they're deeply devotional in nature, but somehow it came, we were attracted to each other, this group, and we met. And it took a while to, to really convey to them that it was okay for them to ask questions. And it appeared for a while that they had no questions to ask. But once that was kind of swept aside, they began to ask questions, and quickly the response came, and it was coming from here, a sort of a non-dual response to many of what they wanted to ask. And so quick was the assimilation, was the understanding and the appeal of it. They found no contradiction, they found no conflict with the, in, in the exchange we had. And it was a delightful experience for me to see this. These are people who are not sophisticated in their thinking, but who could really catch the point and the gist of what was pointed to. They could actually recognize it and somehow, you know, feel the resonance in themselves. And it was enough. And another beautiful thing, when they had had enough, they, they politely left quietly. <laughs> and then uh, they sent message, can we meet again? It was so delicious, the meeting, you know. Mm. So um, uh, I see, in fact, uh, to be honest, I am seeing the self in everybody, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time it was more that I um, see people and I say, okay, I see what is going on for them and all of that. But something has been cleaning out all that even that I is not seen because it's so, it's so a small part of what really is. What is left now is only the being. Then I'm saying, okay, convince me you're not that because that's all I can see. So maybe my eyes are faulty, I don't know. And like this. <laughs> when Ramana was asked, when will the realization of the self be gained? He replied, when the world, which is what is seen, mm. has been removed, yes. there will be realization of the self, which is the seer. Yes. What is the true understanding of the world and how to remove the world? Ah, excellent question, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, from my way of looking at it, the world is not out there. The world is in here. I remember something that happened just now as you're speaking, when uh, Christ was being asked something by his disciples, and he said, trust in God, that was his answer, trust in God, trust also in me, he said, because I have overcome the world. You know? And when I first heard this, I said, but he has never really left his land. He was not, uh, he didn't travel around with a rucksack going from country to country. So what world is he talking about? He, I'm sure he didn't go to Jamaica, he didn't go to you know, Canada, so how can he overcome the world? He's never left his uh, place of birth, hardly. Then it came gradually into the consciousness that the world was inside the mind itself. The common world, the physical, elemental world that we see, is not the world, it is the... In a way, I can say there's one Earth, but there are millions of worlds. In each body, a world is creating daily, momentarily, shaped by our thinking, our programming, conditioning, desire, attachments, all of this flavors and create a world that is really strongly built out of the psyche, a world of emotion, of feeling, of aspiration, mm -hmm. of memories. That's the real world that people are living into. The, the raw material world is just the background, but the world is the world of perception, of interpretation, of dreams, of desire. That's the world of the human being. And so we can never make one world from this place. We have to move beyond the worldly imagining, the worldly experience, into the truth, into our common ground, where we cannot argue about differences, where we really are one. We are still one, even though our worlds are many in our mind. But our meeting place, we cannot make a one world out of our minds. It's a projection that would not last the unity has to be felt and reached, and that unity is beyond the mind, before the world began. It's not talking about millions of years, it's talking about every moment before the world begins. So when Ramana speaks about this, uh, use this type of term, 
when the world that is seen is no more to be seen, then the self will be seen. Meaning, when the world, the meanings, and the one who gives it meaning, when that world vanishes in terms of its, um, uh, its meaning, it seems deeply meaningful, deeply real, because the one who is believing in it is also unreal. And the world is believing is also unreal. They are both thoughts arising in the pure consciousness. So what I understand in these words is that when one sees truly from the place of truth, then all the world, in whichever form it takes, the physical world, the emotional world, the psychic world, all of these worlds are seen to be imagined. And so they lose their power, they lose their potency in the, in the light of pure understanding. Then these worlds vanish, meaning they, they, they vanish in terms of their authority to impose themselves upon the, upon the seer. And they remain only as, like we say, in the, in the hot sun, sunlight, you sometimes can see the, the moon in the same sky as the sun. But then nobody writes poetry to the moon in that aspect. The mind becomes a bit like that. The world becomes very vague, very distant. And still, your beingness is what gives light to that world. These things are not things we practice over and over to, to gain. They arise spontaneously once the seed, mm, the seed being is understood, is recognized. Then all of this arises spontaneously. <coughs> Waves of illumination and clarity comes up into the mind and make all things harmonious again. And this is my, uh, how, I, how it felt to be appreciated in my heart, what uh, Sri Bhagwan said. Mm. Um, I could not find another way of seeing it. Mm. Because obviously, in his own case, uh, after realizing the Self, he continued uh, to build an ashram and to offer advice to people, varying advice to people, read the newspapers, you know, all of these things. So if there was no world, what, who is he in that, you see? So he's not talking about the common world, which is not opposing anything. It is a support for our, our physical uh, aspect. He's speaking about the world of emotion, of uh, desire, of memory, of uh, conceptual thinking. All of that uh, thins out when real understanding happens inside uh, the heart and mind. Mm. This whole process of giving many meetings, meeting many people, being very quiet, something, it's amazing how, how the gift comes. You know? Yes, 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 yes. I often feel, you know, after some kind of retreat or something, I feel like, oh, Primananda, you, got, you get the biggest gift, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's been suggested that the mind must be destroyed for liberation to occur. Do you have a mind and how to destroy the mind? Yes, yes. Again, it is just a terminology that needs to be clarified. The mind must be destroyed. What it really means is that the firm belief, I am the body, the foundation for most fragmented thinking and for all suffering, actually, that that itself must be uh, transcended this very limited idea that gives birth to the feeling of having a mind, a personal mind, and being a person. That must be transcended. And in transcending this, one comes to what you may call natural mind. It may be called Buddha's mind. It can be called no mind. It can be called killing the mind. It's all the same thing. But I feel once we are very strong and strongly attached to some people, they cannot see how can there be a world without the mind? You know, what will happen to kill my mind seems like it's... What a horrible idea to kill one's mind. Is the mind by nature evil? I said, no, the mind is self. The mind is also the self. It is uh, uh, the truth. It's the, it's the names and form as a department of the self. What to kill also? What is understood is that the mind in its aspect, that I am this body, I have autonomy, I am a person, I do what I like, that is ignorance. And as long as consciousness has somehow fallen, descended into the state of believing itself to be the person, I am only, I am this person, and the arrogance of this belief, I am this person, I am the body-mind, then <laughs> it will not be free. It must shake off this idea. Sri Ramana Maharshi actually made a beautiful expression, statement, which I so love, 
he says the eye must remove the eye, yet remain the eye. The natural sense, the feeling I am, which is the beingness, is the absolute actually in its expression as consciousness, the perceiver of uh, existence. That natural sense, which is sexless, uh, raceless, without religion, without belief, without parents, without second, that must shake off the ignorance, I am the body. When it shakes off the belief, I am the body, I am the private thinker, I am the doer of action and the thinker of thoughts, which are themselves thought, when it gets over this, hmm, get rid of this idea, then remain in its natural ascendance, the feeling, I am. So, I am removes the me, yet remain I am. The I removes the I, yet remains the I. It's the same thing. So, it is, it's really a call to awakening from the dream of uh, I am the body, which is a limitation. I am the body also, actually. But it's the body is a very limited and inadequate representation of what truth really is. It is only the vessel, the instrument through which the consciousness can express and experience diversity, which is not a mistake, it is a design, it wants to do it, but somehow it falls asleep uh, in its own projection and must awaken, such as the, such as the play, the Leila, you say. No? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it was suggested to me that um, the thing that made Ramana Maharshi great was that he had a dead mind, you know, and that he operated like a wireless, you know, that existence was simply speaking through him like a wireless, you see, yes. like a receiver. Yes. And yet, as you said earlier, he was reading the newspaper, mm. he was constructing his ashram and almost every day cooking the, the food for the ashram. Yes, the he, yes, he has consciousness. Uh, sometimes people think Ramana is the form Ramana, uh, the body Ramana, and we have, based upon our, on our own sense of identity, that we are, we are persons in a body rather than consciousness or that we are people with consciousness. There's no people, actually. There is just consciousness. Dreaming identity upon itself and feeling that it is an autonomous, independent seeker moving independently in the body. It would be like a wave uh, feeling, you know, I don't want to go this way, I think I want to go this way today. When we know that the, each movement of the wave has the total ocean underneath it. Now that realization, I am a wave, was removed one way or another, from the body of Ramana, what we call Ramana, and Ramana is consciousness. We are consciousness. And his consciousness is reading the newspapers. Uh, it is still taking the taste of the conditioning that arises in the body, which is what happens to consciousness. But that conditioning is so superficial, it is so light, that it doesn't interfere with the consciousness. It's just another way in which consciousness experiences itself. So Ramana expressing a little bit the mix of maybe the seed of some mm -hmm. uh, conditioning that arose because he grew up in a, in a certain place. Those are going to be on the surface expressions. But in the deep, there's no awareness of any personality. He doesn't know what personality is. It's just another, it's just another rumor. It's just another idea. So this is what is meant. Uh, Ramana is like a conduit for something else to move. There's no, he's no separate from that. He is that. We are that. Uh, the, 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 when we say we, this is why quite often I say, when you say we, to what are you referring? Is it the body? So you can say, oh, we as the body is the instrument through which the divine can act. So then, are you the body? Is it the body saying this or something else saying this? You say, okay, maybe it's the mind saying this. And then, what is aware of mind? Because mind says many things. What is aware of mind? What buys into the suggestions of mind? I was going to say, oh yes, actually, it must be the beingness under some kind of spell to believe that it needs to go to the mind for water to quench its thirst. So it's subtle things, but these become increasingly clear with the introspection of uh, self-inquiry. So he is, uh, when we speak of Ramana, he has no personal things. Yes, he has, he has a, a unique uh, temperament. Uh, he expressed himself, he was very, very um, uh, keen to not waste things. That was how the consciousness expressed in that body. In another body, it might throw everything away. Right. And yeah, be equally he would pick up one grain of rice. Because, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. In one farm, 
it may pick up one grain of rice and and hand to 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 the say stop the cooking we need to have this and do it it can do that so so um, attentive to such a small thing you may say but in another body its expression might be throw everything away throw everything away who needs this throw everything away and equally it's as pure because the mind wants to systemize almost like, let's let's imitate Ramana's behavior and then we miss the point so this is uh, something that is uh, I feel uh, as long as we try to learn through the mind, we will make these mistakes. When we understand the gist, the real point, the core of Ramana's pointing, then somehow you can imbibe all of that. And the self will manifest through its natural expression in your form. You see, and still be perfect. And so this is uh, how, I, how, I, how it's understood for me. Like that. To kill the mind, uh, you, can, you can say also, well, where is the mind? Show the mind that we can kill. What instrument are you going to use to kill the mind? <laughs> the mind itself is thought. Mm. Yeah. Okay. What about the tendencies of the mind? Must these be removed before self-realization can become permanent? And how to remove the tendencies? Oh, I see. The tendencies strictly are not really for the mind because the mind is not an entity. Mind is just the arising of thought. The entity apparently is formed when the beingness, the beingness itself, is identified with the mind and some phantom arises out of this identification called the me, the personal modification, and appears to be the driver in this body. And it is that false identity that has vasanas because uh, the self has no tendency. The pure self cannot have any tendency. The body cannot have any tendency apart from it has its unique expression because it's a unique combination of the elements. So it will have its uniqueness of expression, but it is not the root of sentience. It doesn't know, it doesn't have a way of deciding things. So in between that innocent body, the mechanism body, and the pure consciousness, which cannot be said to have any sin, cannot have any weaknesses or tendencies, what is it that can have tendency is the idea we have of who we are which we call the ego, the belief, which is never constant. It's like a constantly changing self-portrait. And so the belief we have about who we are has other beliefs about itself and is suffering from its, from its, uh, from its belief. It is like trying to, I mean, how do you cure a ghost with anorexia? This is what was my point, you see. The ghost has got anorexia, it's believing, you know, wow, you know, I'm really fat when everybody's thinking, all the other ghosts think you're really slim. And let's work to try and heal this ghost with anorexia. Let's try and heal the ghost with anorexia. And the ghost is healed only to find it doesn't exist. <laughs> this is, the, this is the, what is found out. The way in which we are thinking of ourself is not a truth, it's not a fundamental truth. It is only a concoction. It is the self, who we really are, that's believing that we are the person, the private person. And the power of belief is such that belief creates. We believe it into existence. I don't want to say it's a fault. It seems like it's the way the mechanism of manifestation works. That it was a design in our expression to experience and conditioning. And in the same way, I say that all the beings in the ocean are wet. All the beings in manifestation get conditioned. And somehow it seems that the game of truth finding is to wake up from the power of the hypnosis of our conditioning, that we are merely our body minds. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what about destiny? Do you expect things to simply happen? Or are you expressing your free will and choosing? Really, again, everything hinges on this simple thing. When one realizes the truth of who oneself is and the correct position in terms of the root of perceiving, and all of these things come harmoniously into recognition by themselves. We speak of destiny. And destiny, once we believe we are a person, then our life becomes a life of events. Some events are auspicious, some are inauspicious. We're always looking for what benefits us and trying to avoid what causes us pain. This is the life 
lifestyle of the ego identity. So therefore, it is very, very much in our thinking that what happens or what does not happen. So for a sage, what happens or doesn't happen is completely relevant. Knowing all of it is unreal. But for the one who has not found this out yet, it very much matters what happens and what doesn't happen. So it is for the body-mind that destiny plays and not for the pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is a beyond and above all such modifications which can only run rampant in the realm of the mm, <clears throat> relative, you may say. So the, the, the play of destiny, the play of... Um, uh, is only really at the body-mind level. What the body does, even the blinking of the eye or the swallowing of spittle or the turning of the head or the scratching of the knee, is all somehow destined, somehow. We don't have to, thankfully I say, you don't have to believe in it, okay? You don't have to believe. Whether you believe or not, maybe you are destined to not believe it right now and maybe destined to believe it later, but it doesn't matter. Don't fix it as a criteria for knowing who you are. If I say, whatever you do is destined. If you say, I can change my mind a thousand times. Okay, and we're counting up 999, okay, a thousand and two times. It's just the destiny of the play that it will happen like this. Knowing this, if one can relax with all of that, fine. If you cannot, then forget about destiny. <laughs> because it's not important to know this in order to be free. It is just mind food. In a way, those who see can confirm, actually, Everything is, uh, is obeying uh, the, the, the seed of destiny. It's like uh, we're in a collective destiny. Just like uh, the genetic information in a seed will determine how that seed will grow. But once that seed is put into the earth, other forces are acting upon it that are not in the seed. It's in a, a greater seed. Like how the wind will blow, how much sun it will be, how much shade it will have, who will water it is also part of that destiny, but it was not in the destiny of the DNA of that seed. So it's just in the, in the DNA of the cosmos. So it's all something very grand, all this play. But I am more inclined to say to people, just focus only upon recognizing that you are the one who merely sees. Don't have to try and manipulate. Even the feeling of manipulation is also a phenomenon that is being perceived. No matter how subtle, and there are some uh, sensations even that are so subtle, there are no names in any language for them. Still, you are subtler still because you are the perceiver of them. And this is really an invitation to pay attention. Who, who could you possibly be who is able to see the most subtle and the most gross? To see what happens and what does not happen, what comes and what goes. And yet this itself remains uh, unmoving. Can the unmoving be perceived? Does it have any phenomenal quality that it can be perceived? Can it be other than your own self? And these contemplations completely wash the noise out of the mind itself and helps to uh, <clears throat> show a pure reflection of who we are, even in the purified intellect. Who is the master? What is the master's role? and how to recognize a true master. So maybe I take you through. Mm. It appears essential to meet a master and surrender to that master. Who is the master? Ah, I see. Yes, yes, yes. The master is the one who has gone beyond all the doubts that will appear in the mind of the ordinary human being, who has transcended all of those doubts, all ignorance, arrogance and is in clear understanding that I am not an object. I am not that which is born and that which dies. I am not even the one who is living even as this person who has a life. I am life. That knowledge is there. You may say Master is the embodiment of all of that which is pure and true within ourself and that such a master is really made visible. It's our own inmost core truth uh, made visible in form of a human being. Whether that human being is a man or a woman, it's irrelevant. 
but that principle is embodied in that form. It is in fact a, a reflection of our true nature. But a master cannot feel, I am a master actually, not in the mind, not in the way of the mind. They only are sure that uh, they are not what most people think that they are. There is nothing that is uh, desiring to get to another place that is perceived to be better. There is nothing to heal or to fix or to change. That this manifestation comes into play and will fulfill its intention, exhaust its expression and go back again into the source. They are aware of this. It's just pure knowledge. The true Master is pure knowledge, pure and direct uh, knowledge of the Self. And we are that, actually. It is said, uh, in here we use the term Satguru, meaning the Supreme Nor dwells within our heart as our own Self. And which is the more real, the we or that Satguru? That we are that, but in its manifestation, as being the body and the identity, it seems to come into some kind of dichotomy where it believes itself to be also the person, and then the person is trying to find the real, but it's just a play, it's only an illusion. We are the Sat Guru principle, experiencing itself temporarily with the belief, I am the body, which it must recover from this distortion. Then it says that when the self falls under the spell of its own projections, it cannot come out, then it must manifest also as the master to speak to itself, who is in delusion, to return, come back, you have an appointment within. And like this is one way of, ex of expressing it that I, I like. I'm fond of this expression. Not absolutely, but it's a beautiful way of putting it. And what is the master's role? Master's role is to tell you that really there is no... Um, that you are already that which you are seeking. The master is really the mirror. And he's pointing you, you are already that which you are searching for. The highest truth, you are already this. You simply must recognize this in your heart by removing what is false about yourself. The false belief that I am the body must go. And the master proves how this belief is itself false and is not in service to the truth that you are. So that's the role of the master to point you, you are that. You are that. And when you are in direct recognition of your own self, you will be beyond need, you will be beyond suffering, you will be beyond troubles. You see, you are the all-encompassing whole. You are the pure reality. He is only to tell you this thing. He cannot give you something more. Anything give you something you can lose. He can only point you to what you cannot lose. You only imagine that you lost or dreamed you became separate from it. This is the role of a master, you may say. Yes. And how to recognize a true master? If we are in a state of uh, strong identification with our body mind experience and conditioning, we are not equipped to judge uh, a master because masters can be so diverse in their expression and we are always judging the expression rather than being able to see the core because some masters are so outrageous in their expressions, another one is so elegant, so simple, so loving, you see, like this. How to judge? Generally, one in whose presence, either the mind becomes very quiet without effort, and it becomes easy to sense the words that they speak. But also, it can be that in the presence of Master, the mind becomes very, very noisy for a while also, you see. But there will be a subtle inner recognition of what that noise indicates, that it's an auspicious noise, that he brings up the noise that is dormant, so that it's coming up to the surface to bubble up and to go out. You will know this. And one whose actions and behavior does not continuously demoralize the seeker, you see, but whose skillful ways of expressing guides the seeker in the most direct and simple way, each one, understanding and knowing them to be his or her own self. How to recognize, Master, I've just said, in whose presence you feel a natural respect. 
you feel somehow uh, the sense of coming out of some ignorance. If you find some being like this, whose association uh, brings joy and peace inside you, whose association uh, triggers a higher aspiration to be free from the influence of our negative conditioning, then if you find such a one, hang out with them. Their company will be beneficial for you. Then you may come intuitively, spontaneously to feel a recognition in your heart so deep that uh, it's not coming from your mind, a conviction that you are connected with this being for as long as they bring you into the recognition of the Self, like this. But don't be in too much of a hurry, because otherwise the mind will use your impatience and your tendency to judge to throw you off the scent. However, if it is the destiny's play that this body will come into contact with this body, and through that outer contact and inner contact will be revealed, that will be of benefit mm, to the seeker, then that will be the destiny of that one. If you are meant to be with the Master in the heart, you will not be able to avoid it. <clears throat> if you are not meant to be, you will not be able to bring it about. <clears throat> Traditionally, uh, devotees had tremendous devotion to the Master. Please say something about devotion in the pursuit of awakening. Devotion has to be there. Devotion has to be there. My own master, Sri Punjaji, he used to say, the truth will not reveal itself in an arrogant mind. Some devotion, some humility must be there. They pave the way uh, for the appearance of the Lord inside the heart, like this. So somehow um, this devotion is a, you may say, that is the, it is the announcing of grace is coming. Grace is coming. And there is no arrogance. And many times in the, there are two types broadly of devotees or, or of seekers of truth. There are those who have a very much a devotional temperament and there are others whose way is more to the intellect. Of the two, the, those who are more inclined to be arrogant is the ones who go through intellect. They're inclined to feel, I don't need anything, you know, there's nobody there, Who, who's going to help me, I don't need anything, this type of arrogance. And so it's very slow, very difficult for them to really realize the truth in the heart. They may feel they realize it, but it's in the head. And until really it gets confirmed in the heart, they are not really free, whatever they think. Hmm? They will be sometimes speak beautiful words, but it will be like giving you a beautiful chocolate cake smelling like sardines. <laughs> it will not be authentic. Mm -hmm. There are those whose tendencies tend to be more devotional and they mm, are less likely to exhibit arrogance. It's just the nature of devotion is like that. It's humble and it's kind. It's a broader way. But there are some, let's say, challenges in both expression. With the people who are, tend to be devotional, sometimes they are too much attached to emotion. You see, and uh, both are, they're like two wings of one bird. They have to reflect each other a bit. Because devotion without wisdom is very, very wishy-washy. And uh, again, uh, knowledge without devotion is very dry and lifeless. So they kind of need to happen somehow. It doesn't mean that one should say, okay, I am going to be devotional or I am going to be. It doesn't work like this. The true teacher recognizes the temperament of each devotee and guides them accordingly. And the ones who are devotional, they will find the quickest way to the recognition of the self inside the heart. The ones who are more in, in, in the mind and more uses more the intellect, they will find a way in which to avoid the pitfalls of arrogance, of selfishness and self-centeredness, to cut through and to also recognize the self in the heart. In either way, the self has to be recognized in the heart. And by heart, I mean in the core of one's being. It cannot be that it is recognized only intellectually. It may sound beautiful, but it will be the difference between a plastic rose and a real rose. They may look beautiful and the same from a distance, but up close you will see the difference. So it is very important that this understanding happens in the heart. And devotion really 
is a safe way. Even the masters will say that although, even with the non-dual teachings, they will tell you, if keep inside your heart an attitude of gratitude, it will, it will protect you from arrogance which will make your path slippery. You see? So this feeling of uh, uh, giving thanks for all that helps to remind you of who you are is uh, very important both for the bhaktas and for the, the jnani types. So devotion I put very, very, very high. Sometimes people who come more from an intellectual background tend to look down on people with bhakti to feel like they're very naive and very quick to give away their trust to others and so on. And they themselves are so tied up sometimes in their own sort of self-reliance that they don't really evolve into the heart. So <clears throat> devotion is at the heart of it. And devotion is sweet when mixed with wisdom, you know, beautiful, <clears throat> strong, and soft. And then also the intellect can be strong and clear, but also soft with the warmth of uh, devotion and love. Beautiful. Then it fulfills itself. Jnana fulfills itself. Uh, wisdom fulfills itself with love. And love fulfills itself with wisdom. Seekers often have curious ideas about the enlightened state. Please describe your typical day and how you perceive the world. Ah. Someone asked one time, Muji, when you wake up, what is your first uh, response to the world? And I found the words coming out. The word said, nothing remains untouched. Everything is as it is. Uh, there is no mm, desire to push things about. Eyes open, images are perceived. Everything is happening by itself. Even in our, we are here now in India, we have a very full program. Things are happening all the time. And yet nothing here feels strained by it. There's more sometimes a sense of strain when uh, I am being asked to use my mind for mundane things or people who are caught up in a sort of like a, a mental world who wants to engage and this is a bit tiresome. Mm. My day, mostly I hardly notice it. I hardly notice it in terms of events. What is my day is full of silence and peace. Everything arises spontaneously. There's no abiding sorrow. There's room for everything. Every emotion, every thought can come. But they have no real landing place to stay. Everything is a tourist, comes and goes. I'm really unconcerned, really, about it. There is something here that really cannot be described, cannot be described at all. But once it has announced itself, made itself felt, everything else became a secondary taste. It's okay. It is still the everything else. It's still the secondary taste also. Mm -hmm. But this, this, uh, I don't know what a typical day <laughs> is. Do you, do you cook yourself Jamaican food? Still? Sometimes, yes, yes. Particularly <laughs> when I'm in, where I'm, I'm, if I'm at home, right. in the kitchen I'm used to, then I like cooking. Right. I'm very comfortable with cooking, very easy. Mm. We don't use a cookbook or nothing. We just cook and lots of different things. Mm -hmm. And also there are other activities that we are part of sometimes. I might be painting or we're doing so many different things, doing the garden or whatever. Just what arises and feels pleasing in the moment, that seems to come about by itself. Here in India is probably the most programmed existence for a while. It seems we're doing this and then after this, then another thing. And it just is accepted that just is also part of the way in which this has all been expressed like that. Mm -hmm. And there is a joy in this. And there are many people who, who move in this environment now, for a while was feeling, oh, there's too much work, there's too much to do. And then reach a point where they realize, I'm doing nothing at all. They come to see, I'm doing nothing at all. Mm -hmm. Something moves out the way. The one who is claiming to be the doer drops off and just activities arise by themselves. But inside this, the core of it, there is something that is indefinable, mm. out of which all the energy is coming, all the love is coming, all the joy is coming, and it's not attached to these even. 
And earlier we were looking at your your uh, drawings and sketches. Yes, yes, yes. Is that part of your life that you you have an artist? You know, art? it used to be. It used to be every day I was painting. I loved painting. Right. Loved creating with the hands. I loved it for so long. Mm. Every day I was painting. And now not so much. Now somehow if like the idea came for putting the illustrations in a book, and I found myself making these illustrations, and it's so much pleasure actually. Because now it's, it's, there's a freedom in it, there's a freedom in the play of it. That I remember, I used to be a, somehow feel like, oh, I spoiled a painting or something. I was making it, oh, I spoiled it. Now it, this feeling is not there. It can be spoiled. Let's do another one. Let's turn it into something else. There's a freedom in all of it. And um, then sometimes people say, would you like to do more? I said, yes, but I don't know. It may not come about. You know, we brought some materials here to work. I've not done anything more than a few sketches here that needed, were needed for the book. So there are a lot of things uh, that simply arise in the broadness of expression. No, uh, it happens, and uh, but there's no attachment to these activities. In fact, this is the difference. There's no attachment to them. Mm. So we we've come to the last question. You've given us a profound discourse on awakening. When you would meet someone with a passion for awakening, mm. what would your short advice be? Uh, you see, that short advice would show itself. <laughs> <laughs> it show itself because uh, sometimes I am meeting somebody, and they come. Some some people come. They say, "Oh, really? I'm really. This thing is burning in me." And I say, "Okay, come. Let's sit down. Have a cup of tea." And everything is just in the moment. Everything is in the moment. Some people come and they seem like they are, they are burning, they are on fire for something. And I might just leave them to enjoy your cup of tea, I have nothing to say. It, it's just like this, it might be felt like this. Another one might come casually speaking and then after a few words, something is very deepened and present. And somehow without any intention, something detonates inside and uh, 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 some profound seeing take place. All I would say is, as much as possible, Leave your intentions aside. And leave what you think you know aside for a moment. Just be, just be here for now. Let's see what happens. Usually something at least comes out of it. But I'm not attached to what comes out of it. And I've seen such beautiful encounters take place. Communion, I would say. But uh, what is in, in these uh, kind of exchanges, I'm totally free and relaxed about it. If nothing seems to happen, then nothing happened. I think always something happened. But what happened, I don't know. Sometimes it is obvious, it's clear that some shift, something has been burped out. Another time it feels like you're speaking with someone who has just got glassy eyes and nothing is happening at all. But I don't know, I, there's no me in charge. This is what happens. <laughs> there's no me in charge, what's going on. Let's just see what happened. Mm. And uh, life somehow seems to be unfolding out of its own self, including this body is included in that drama, in that play, like this. Mm. I'm feeling I'm not doing anything at all. I'm not doing anything at all. Mm. This is my joy, my freedom. I am not doing anything. Mm. It's just somehow happening. And yet at the same time, I can have the sense I'm doing something also. Sometimes I have the sense I'm doing something, but generally even the feeling I'm doing something, sits inside a bigger feeling that I'm really not doing anything. So everything goes. And at the same time, everything I can throw away. Everything goes, and at the same time, everything I can throw away. You see? And... Uh, in my heart, nothing is happening at all. In my heart, nothing is happening of any significance to put even on the back of a stump. I don't feel like it. But in another way, sometimes it's expressed, oh, let's do this and let's do that. But it just seems like it's the play of existence. It speaks like this. And there is a clear discernment that it is okay. All of it is okay. Every single thing is okay. And yet, mm -hmm. it's nothing. It's nothing. And I don't mean that in a disrespect to life or whatever, but it's nothing. It's nothing to that out of which it is pouring out. It's nothing. If 
from age after age, movements are taking place, but nothing to report. This is a true. And yet, sometimes a, a child says something or someone is, expresses a, an expression of kindness and I'm, I'm full of tears and emotion or something. This has also happened, no? <laughs> mm. It is like that, no? I am not wanting it to end or to continue. It's, it's somehow... I enjoy my life, I have to say. I enjoy my life, no? But nothing moves to try and preserve it so deeply. It just is... The consciousness is here, the body is here, and experiencing seems to happen in it, but it's not anything I want to even talk about. Mm. Mm. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.